Okay. Thank well, I want to thank everybody who who will be joining us today, whether you're doing it live right now or later on this evening or whatever day that you can get to it. We do have Frank Sandoval as our guest today, and he's a very entertaining man. Uh, <laughs> and I also want to give a shout out uh, to my sponsor. We're about a minute early, so uh, I'm going to try to delay this for just a few seconds. Um, I do have issues with my camera. I'm switching it over to a better system. <laughs> but until then, we're kind of stuck with me going very, very light and very, very dark. And I know it's annoying, but I apologize for that. So with that being said, I'd like to introduce um, my sponsor, Luscious Moss Studio. It is owned and operated by Chad Quist. Uh, he is out of Edgewood, Washington. He produces all of my music. And uh, he basically is set up for drummers and guitarists. And he does recording at his studio, but he has created an environment uh, where people feel comfortable, create, you know, it's very collaborative and a very creative workspace. So with that, you can find him on Facebook, just type in Lester Studio and come up for you. So Frank, I think we're ready for this whole broadcast. I'm so excited. <laughs> I love your place. I love all the guitars. And uh, anyway, I, I want to start this interview by asking you, how in the world did you ever get into music and, and um, you know, some of the influences that you had during your journey? Oh, that's a long story, of course, like like most people. But we uh, have time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, like, I suppose I'm uh, like many people in the sense that um, you know, started in high school and me and my best friend bought guitars one day. Uh, I, spo I suppose since we have time, I'll tell you the slightly long version of it. Okay. Uh, yeah, 20 dumped, minutes or so. <laughs> got dumped by a girl, so I uh, went out and bought a guitar. That's that's the way it should be if you ask, if you ask me. Uh, what was that comment? Don't buy a girl. Got dumped. But my girlfriend you broke got up. A with me. Oh my goodness! That, my girlfriend broke up with me, uh, so I went out and bought a guitar, like like everyone should. And uh, my best friend did too. And we were we were going to start a band. We we're going to be we we're going to take over the world. It was going to be awesome. So uh, in in my household, uh, you know, there's there's no music. There's no musicians in my in my household in, in my entire family really. Uh, so I was learning from from nothing. Like I had, I had nothing to go by. I, I, what I did is actually I bought a bass guitar because I like bass, uh, and I would just sit there in, in my room with a little practice amp and just go, you know, thump, <laughs> thump, just like because I had no idea. I didn't know anything about music, not the first clue, and there was no other to teach me. So my friend and I would get together and we'd figure out a riff of a song, and we thought it was amazing. Like, can't believe we just played that two seconds of a popular song that's on the radio. Oh my God, I can't believe it. Um, so him and I, we were never in a band. It was just the two of us, but we started slowly, slowly learning. And eventually my friend, you know, gave it up basically. So I got a hold of a bunch of other guys around town and we started a band. And after high school, we were able to, you know, put together a, a band, drums and guitar and a singer and like, practice in my mom's garage and um, pieced it all together you know luckily that like the drummer came from a from marching band in, in school and the guitar player knew a thing or two so they were all better than me so I was able to pull it along pretty good and we played a couple of gigs and things were going good you know in our minds uh, of course it didn't take long at all for that to break up but uh, but that's how I got started you know just Typical oh. high school way. So where did you grow up in? Are you from Washington? Uh, from Snohomish. Okay, so today. you're born and bred. Huh? All right. Um, what kind of music were you playing? I have no clue. And we do have Bob Kedrick, one you know, of the people who is, um, he's my shadow. Everywhere I go, he's there. <laughs> but I got to get into Snowtown. He hasn't come there yet. But anyway, Bob, and I'm sure um, this, the Frank Sandoval uh, place would uh, fit your music, so come on down. But anyway, uh, what kind of music were you playing at the time? 
Uh, back then, it was, you know, that's kind of when the grunge scene was uh, hit and like Nirvana and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Stuff that was just easy enough to play along to, you know. Right. Of course, before that, whatever the pop rock that was on the radio was like big hair and flashy clothes and pointy guitars. I lived in Snohomish at the time, so there wasn't, you know, that didn't exactly relate to me. Yeah. When Nirvana came out. I mean, super, super easy songs. But still sounded good, so that's how that's how I really latched on to music. So you went you went from there to where? I mean, when was the first time that you guys made money at what you were doing? Uh, so yeah, that band played a couple of gigs, just like dive bar, nothing, nothing fancy whatsoever. Yeah. Um, like <laughs> I remember we, uh, we we played a handful of uh, gigs in Everett. And we got paid like 20 bucks or something, you know, a cut of the door, as they say. And it was like, like seriously, 20, $25. So that, was, <laughs> that didn't really go too far. It didn't, didn't work out too well. But, I mean, it was experience. And right. I really, right. really uh, appreciate it, in all honesty. Even though it was a dive bar and everyone, you know, can talk, talk poorly about places that don't pay or they, you know, that are a dive. It's, right. if, if you can... If the starting band can come in and get their feet wet, then there's a place for those kind of, you know, those kind of. Right, right. Uh, so after that, that 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 band broke up. Then I was on uh, looking through the newspaper, like you used to do in the day, looking for bass players wanted, and this <laughs> this other this band said bass player wanted, you know, girl fronted, you know, jazz rock. I, I forget how they said it, but um, called them up. In for a, uh, no, I think they mailed me a tape. It was back in those days, cassette tape, and it was really good. It was a little bit, a little bit experimental-ish, a little, little out there. It wasn't just straight ahead rock, but it, <clears throat> it was good. And I could hear that the singer was phenomenal. <clears throat> so I went down and you know I learned a couple songs off of the tape, and I went down and the band is called Fedora, and Fedora had uh, like a really cool drummer guitar player, me on bass, and then we brought in a saxophone player, and the girl who sang played piano. Uh, her name is Jen Ayers, and she's still around town, and she does, you know, the, uh, uh, she does, like, big theatrical shows nowadays, like, yeah. I mean, one of, almost, one of the most talented people I've ever worked with. We did, we, I joined that in about 1993 or so. I can't remember. And uh, I was in that band for several years and we played all kinds. That was the first real recording uh, experience that I got. We put out a couple of albums. Um, it played all over Seattle. We actually uh, opened opened the show for um, Chicago and Hall and & Oates at the Gorge and Fit, the band Fish at the Gorge. Uh, so some really good experience there. Yeah. So, that Gorge is a phenomenal place. Um, my husband and I used to work for Rhino Events, and they're out of Tempe, Arizona. And, and we were, I did a lot of the driving and wardrobe, but I also rolled courts and set up stages. And that one was a bear. Wow. They have, they, their equipment, their towers are phenomenal. Yeah. What an experience. That's wonderful. Yeah. So, I- at that time, were you singing? Were you doing backup vocals? Oh, no, never, never sang. You know, the funny thing is, I never, never even sang at all. Uh, uh, it took a long time before I got into singing. I was just playing, you know, bass in a band. <laughs> so we had a cut before I go back to that. Hold that, hold our spot there. Uh, I got, I got to say something to Bob Kedrick. You are, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not the I'm new boy. boy. <laughs> you just have good you're just following my good taste anyway i have a, another listener on here said i love watching you guys i don't know who they are so just a reminder that when you post please let us know who you are so that we can recognize you uh you have to type your name so we know okay so at this point you were just playing, you were playing bass in the fedora, is that correct? correct okay so when did you start picking up the guitar um, you know, it was, so a little bit after that, so that that band split ways, and I 
knew a friend who played drums in a band and they needed a bass player, but it was like straight hard rock, heavy metal. <laughs> that wasn't really my, my taste at the time exactly, but I had nothing better going on. And it was right there in my, in Everett where I, where I lived at the time. And, um, so I went and I, I met him and we, we jammed a little bit and, you know, I didn't even really, I didn't even really join the band because I just wasn't looking for heavy metal. Like I didn't, didn't really think I had the chops as they say, but uh, <laughs> next thing you know, months and months have gone by and we were like booked a show. Like, well, I guess I'm in this band. I don't know. So we, <laughs> so we formed this band called Jelly Neck. Now if you look up the band Jelly Neck, Okay, I will. <laughs> to make sure you have your speakers down. No. <laughs> it is loud and aggressive. But after a while, I, I realized, like, you know, plenty creative. Lots of create, lots of lots of opportunity to be creative, you know. Right. So I was right. in this band Jelly Neck for, boy, I think it was about 14 years. Oh, my gosh. It, for, for an all original heavy metal project, that's that's a lifetime, you know. So we started started back at back at zero, just barely putting stuff together, and we got a, a new singer in and all that stuff. Started recording, started playing plenty of shows. Well, it's it was such heavy metal that I wanted to add, a, you know, find space for like some 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 melody, some melodic lines. Right. So I I got the backup mic, and after a while. I would sing like little, I would like back him up, even though he's a big heavy metal singer, right. I would back him up on the mic singing melodically, which gave it like an entirely new sound, like like pretty, it's not something you hear every day from, from local band. So the funny thing is, so I'm doing that and I'm, I'm barely singing. The first time I'd ever been on a mic, really, I was doing that for a long time. During that same time, now here's where things get funny. Back in <laughs> 2000, early 2000s, when the first little recession hit us, mm -hmm. the job I was working at cut our hours. So I was working like three days a week, four days a week, something. I wasn't working the full 40 hours. So I needed to find something to do that didn't cost a lot of money. So at the time I lived in Everett, and I walk, what I would do is... <laughs> make myself a mixed drink in a flat, uh, in a paper cup and I would walk down the street to this um, karaoke bar where I realized because I was listening to Johnny Cash all the time ah, so I realized huh I could sing Johnny Cash I'd get on the mic I, I, I would I would do karaoke every week and I did it every week for months until I really found my voice and then singing in the heavy metal band Got me real microphone time, you know. So that's how I started actually singing. Uh, how long ago was that now? Two, 2000? Oh, oh, that was probably almost 20 years ago. Oh, 20. Okay. Yeah, or something like something along those lines. Yeah. So I okay. uh, was doing that. So then fast forward however many years, Jelly Neck, the uh, heavy metal band, was writing, we're writing new songs, and they're starting to include me to where, like, I'm – kind of, I'm almost like co-lead singer. Okay. The lead singer was the lead singer, but I was more than just backing him up. Like we'd have have me sing a real melodic chorus while he sang the really tough, powerful yeah. verse pre-chorus. Uh, uh, pre right, right. So that's what got me into it. So at the same time, it's like really aggressive heavy metal, which is great for what I wanted. So, so the, the end of that yang, of course, is really basic, you know, strumming three chord songs. So I busted out my acoustic guitar and just played the most basic, most basic songs ever. But like in my voice, Johnny Cash works. So I was singing all the Johnny Cash songs. And that's how I got into this. All right. So from that band, um, you know, I, I never cared much for hard rock and all that since I came here and I do jams all over. I found uh, there's a lot of that around here, <laughs> but, and I'm just now trying to learn the uh, 
the beats the the beats on my guitar and i'm trying to do a song by little big tonk called tornado oh my god <laughs> i got a lot to learn and this never ends right so going from your band that rock band and and becoming uh, aware of your voice and how to use it um how did you get how did you form your band uh johnny loves june well at, around that same time so just, just after that time, just a year or two later, I moved back to Snohomish. And as I'm walking around downtown Snohomish, I see on this uh, that little dive bar down there was called Chubbs, little really small, like two pool tables. They had you know, $3 beers or free peanuts, whatever the point is. A really cool, funky little dive bar. There was a poster that said, Johnny Cash Tribute, March 1st, 2007, at that, oh. at that venue. Well, March 1st is my birthday. And I was seeing Johnny Cash on like, this is a sign. Yes. Sign. So I looked up who was putting it on. Like, I didn't know anybody in that, in that genre, right? I didn't know anybody around town who did it. But I looked him up and I talked to him. I told him who I was. I'm like, here's what I want to do. Let me open your show. Cause so it was, it was a like I can't see. six or seven, six or seven groups coming in. And they were going to do, I don't know, five, six Johnny Cash songs. Like, here's what I want to do. Let me come and open the show. Now, knowing this, you got to realize I had never played guitar and sang <laughs> by myself in front of anybody. Ever. Oh, my gosh. So so what I said is because the, um, the, the people putting it on were um, were the ones hosting it, if you will. They, were, they had like drum kit, bass amp and all that so i'm like well why don't you guys back me up here's the songs there johnny cash so it was pretty easy just told them what key it was in so that night went down there with my guitar and opened the show and we played three songs i don't even remember what they were uh, as nervous as can be <laughs> extremely <laughs> nervous played them did, did okay and sat back in 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 heaven in my hometown and watched a johnny cash tribute on my birthday so oh, wow. all the players because like i said there's like six or seven bands I'm listening to all these bands and I'm like, well, well, that bass player is really cool. And that guitar player is really cool. And that, so what I did is that this is back in the MySpace days. I looked, all, looked them all up on MySpace. I said, that was so fun that night. How would you guys feel about coming to my house and jamming some Johnny Cash songs? And they're like, sure. So I had this like, almost like an all-star group come to my house and we, played Johnny Cash songs for a couple hours. It was so fun. I said, well, let's do it again in a couple of weeks. Next thing you know, I formed a band called Johnny Loves June, which is a Johnny Cash uh, tribute. tribute band. Wow. And, and of those guys, um, Liam, my lead guitar player, yes. and Tyler, upright bass player, are two of the guys that I met that night, and they're still with me today. Wow. That's amazing, right? I, I did get a chance to listen to you. I'm not a dog. Slang, oh my gosh, I like that. Now Liam wrote that. Is did he write that with co-write that with you? Uh he wrote the whole thing. Okay. In Have fact, you... in fact, he said, you know, I got this news, I got this song that's a total Johnny Cash Sun Records kind of sound. And he said it would be good for your voice. Let's make it a Johnny Loves June song. He, he and Tyler are in their own band called the Rainieros, oh. along with the drummer of Johnny Loves June, uh, Donnie. So the three of them, and Liam is the lead singer, so the three of them, along with a uh, another lead guitar player, are a band called the Rainieros. Oh, yeah, I should. I, uh, are they on um, are yeah, they on Facebook? Right you know? Yep. How do you spell it? R-A-I-E-R-S? Uh, R -A I, you know, it's like the, the Rainier beer. Rainier okay. beer. They drink Rainier beer. Rainier. I'll find it. I'll find it. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I keep hearing about this Liam guy. Um, when I listen to the music that he plays for you, and I have listened to some of the stuff I, that you had out on YouTube, but when you put your tags in there where you're tagging, you know, how yeah. to find you, it's really difficult. But I did. I found it. Oh, and, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I was listening to um, his licks, and he sounds a lot like rockabilly, which uh, 
Yeah. 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 yeah they, uh, Ray Nero's have a little bit of a rockabilly. They, they do a little bit of a little bit of rockabilly, a little bit of country swing, like a lot. They're yeah. looking up their grade. Yeah. I had to hire I had to hire Chad Chris, who's the lead player for Heart by Heart, just to try to figure out how to do rock beats. You're ahead of me because you're, <laughs> I just know country. <laughs> anyway, uh, um, so what happened after this band? Um, you still have it. I see it on your on your wall. Unfortunately, we can't see the stage from here. He has the most unique stage you've ever seen at that area. His guitar is everywhere. Can, can you use a little clue on about all those guitar, uh, guitars that you have there? Uh, so yeah, we um, so so we can back it up. This is Snowtown Brewery located mm -hmm. here in Snohomish yes. and we, we we opened this brewery uh, seven years ago with the idea that we would brew beer and have live music. And of course we're small, so it was going to be like small acoustic, you know, one or two players. Mm -hmm. um, we had a friend of ours build a little stage and mm -hmm. that stage served us pretty well for a couple of years. And music started becoming popular enough to where we actually removed a couple of tape uh, a table with a couple of chairs and extended the stage out to what it is today. Oh. So mm -hmm. we started out with just a couple of guitars on wall hangers around the stage. And we had, I started getting more. So I had to put them, had to fit them in like a jigsaw puzzle. You know, we'd have, we'd have two this way. So I'd have to put more this way. Uh, so now it's, it's filled and we got them up to the ceilings. So the beauty on that, when you come in and you see the stage, and you see all the guitars is, um, there's my main player and there's a couple of bass guitars which work well but besides that almost all the rest are you know either broken or work next and i hadn't paid over 20 dollars for any one of those guitars some of them were donated uh some people like uh i got a mandolin that a friend of ours like hey this thing's a little bit warped put it on your wall somebody else came in with a, another guitar here put this on your wall so if you've got a guitar sitting around, not 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 doing anything, and you want to give it a good home, are you the guy? Are you the guy that um, wants the used bass strings? No, I last night I went to a jam and do well. Uh, it's put on by Doug McGrew and Lynn Sorensen, and Lynn Sorensen, of course, was the bass player for Bad Company for a while from 2000, I believe, into 2008, somewhere there, and he agreed that uh, to give us his his. Um, his used yeah. guitar or bass strings. Oh, so okay. I think he did some there yeah. too. Yeah, yes, please. Yeah, I use those for actually, I use them on our tap handles. I make our oh. No Town Brewery tap handles and I use drumsticks and I, I bind them together and then I wrap them in bass strings. Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> I read another comment here. It's Michael McMath and he's, um, He's a he's, he's a great guy. I don't know if he comes into your place or not, but he follows. I know I, him. You know him. Okay. Hi, Michael, and I'm glad you joined us. So I have a question about the brewery. I was reading, I was listening to an interview that you did about how your brewery got started since we're on that topic. And I thought, wow, this is incredible that you went to uh, someplace, uh, garage sale or whatever, and got a brew kit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh Bought a, bought a homebrew kit 30 years ago or so. This is a long time ago. Oh, okay. And it was a pretty complex kit. Along yeah. with the, the instruction book was like advanced. Okay. So looked through the book, couldn't make sense of it, and just kind of put it away. <laughs> years later, there's a homebrew store in Everett. Um called homebrew heaven and they sell sold at the time a box that had everything pre-measured and also had a uh, step easy to follow step-by-step -step instruction started with that and it was it worked out great from there you know that was a long time ago from there here we are snowtown brewery 
Yeah, I think you skipped a part. That the, I like the best part of it was that after you, somebody said to you, and we're not going to say who, but somebody had said to you that you had to make some, you know, when you had this kit, they, they knew that you had the kit, so we had to make some beer. And so I understand from that interview that that's where it kind of started. But the interesting part is all the awards that you've won from your beer. Can you tell us a little bit about that story? Uh, yeah, you know, it's it's that... I brew often. I, we're very, very small. You can see the equipment behind me. And, <laughs> shiny, and for, very shiny. <laughs> for a brewery that has been around for seven years, we've been seven years in this location. Uh, seven years and still be this small is kind of rare. You know, like usually people expand and get bigger and all that, but we're cramped on space, number one. Uh, number two, I like to brew. So it's it's easy to refine processes and recipes when you're brewing all the time yeah well there was one other thing that about that um when we first came in neither my husband or i drank and if i may have the occasional drink now and then but um i get too old for that stuff <laughs> That's so well, but uh, so we we saw a root beer on the sign, I think it was, and uh, we got a couple of oh my goodness, your root beer is stellar. How does that happen? We, you know, there's uh, there's always something for everybody. We uh, obviously have beer here at Snowtown Brewery, uh, but we also have locally made wines and then all kinds of craft, you know, sodas and root beer, and there's always something for somebody. We wanted to be more than just beer. You know, we started with, um, we wanted music and we want people to be comfortable. So we're trying to, trying to give a little, little bit to everybody. Now you do have a very, a very um, creative and friendly down home kind of atmosphere in there that just, it, it definitely, the, from the minute that I walked in, I felt comfortable, but I wasn't really sure about you, but now that I hear your background and I know you were a rocker for 14 years, it all fits. It all falls into place. <laughs> so, anyway, so now you said seven years, you've been nine or seven or nine? Seven. Seven. So what was, I mean, most people, um, I know this, this, I don't want to mention a competitor, but I will. Um, there was a place in, in, in Vessels that I used to go to in Woodenville called Vessels Tap House, and they moved. And he was telling me that um, during COVID, uh, they had one heck of a time. And, you know, he was shut down and he didn't really get back until last August. So from what little I know about breweries and wineries around here that don't have big money behind them, uh, that must have been a very trying time. Is there anything that you could uh, comment about um, what you did or what was going yeah. on? Yeah, you know, you want to hear you want to hear an interesting story. So COVID happened. And as it's happening, of course, as a business owner, I'm stressed and I, I can't get my mind straight because I, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know. Yeah. First of all, I don't know if people are going to die. Right. Yeah, we all thought we were all hearing crazy rumors that, that this could be the end of, you know, could wipe out a certain amount of people. But um, I was also concerned about business. And when they said, you know, we got to shut the doors and you can't, you know, can't gather, I was wondering how how I'm going to survive. How are we going to make it? Sitting in my backyard, sitting on a lawn chair, staring at the sky, wondering what's going. How's how's this going to work out? when um, the, the head brewer at Scuttlebutt Brewing in Everett calls me up, says, hey, Frank, I have this, this you know, small canning machine. Do you want to borrow it? And we have all these cans that will, I, I talked to the owner, he said, and I'll sell you these cans at the same price we get them for. Huh. Are you kidding me? Of course. So I went over there, got the machine, got the cans, and we, you know, at the time we could have people come in, fill the growlers. But then we also added those cans, 16 ounce cans of, of packaged beer. Oh. And within two months, it's, we had, luckily, luckily we'd been around for, was it like five years then? 
once we had the cans in, in packaged up, we had made enough money off of the cans to buy our own canner. So we gave <laughs> it back to him and we bought our own canning system. We bought a pallet of cans. Since then, we've been canning beer. Then with that, we bought, we, we earned enough money off of that to buy a little mini cooler that stands next to the cash register and it has a glass door so you can see the cans. <laughs> um, so that, between that and our pretty loyal following, we stayed a Very loyal. <laughs> yeah, and the thing is, so we got through it all, right? We got through, I, and, and it almost sounds like I'm bragging here, but I mean, if it's the truth, it's the truth. People all around us were seeing all these people take money from the government, these grants, these, you know, was it PPP loans or whatever. They're, they're taking all this money and they're doing all this, whatever they're doing with this. Now, some people really needed that. I understand. I, I, and then I'm, I'm not trying to diminish any of that, but I'm going to tell you, Snowtown Brewery got through without taking a penny of the government money. And by government, I mean us. Yeah. Yes. Um, we, we made it through and we made it through stronger than ever without taking any government money. I think you are sort of under a lucky star, Frank. <laughs> well, I don't, I don't believe in luck. I believe it's hard work. Well, well, um, yes. <laughs> is that, is that a, a discussion for another time? Yes, a whole discussion. <laughs> so um, I don't know who people are, uh, who these people are. They haven't identified themselves, but there is a place when you go in that allows you to put your name in there so we, we can see it, but it's being missed somehow. Anyway, um, there's one comment to me, um, says you're an amazing lady, never forget it. Oh, great. I am. Thank you. <laughs> and the other one just is right on for, for what you were just saying, Frank, about, but yeah. And that's amazing. And and yes, it is a lot of hard work. And I, you know, I was watching you work it, when you're when you're an artist and you go in there to play. This guy is like a ping pong ball. I mean, he's everywhere. It's just all over the place. <laughs> he puts your sound, very good sound, by the way. Uh, he, he adjusts your sound, your guitar sound. Um, he makes sure that you're comfortable and then just lets you go for it. And in the meantime, he's everywhere. I think maybe he's, <laughs> I don't want to say it. I don't want to be blasphemous, but you know, God, like God, you're everywhere. <laughs> yeah, well, once again, hard work. That's right. Absolutely. But then again, but then again, it's not work if you love it. So yes. it's all good. So on the, on the uh, songwriter part of this, have you written any songs yourself? Yeah, yeah, I got a couple of songs out there. If you if you search them, uh, search Frank Sandoval and search the number eighty eight four one nine. That was that was the first song. Line. Now the story behind that, if you want me to get into it. Yeah. So of course, Johnny Cash fan, right? And I'm listing, uh, you know, I'd, I'd owned uh, Live at Folsom Prison, Live at San Quentin, all these Johnny Cash albums, and they're all great. Uh, one day I get my hands on the extended version of Johnny Cash Live at Folsom Prison. Now oh. keep in mind, my, my name is Frank Sandoval, right? The extended version of uh, Live at Folsom Prison, between songs, the... Uh, the warden gets over the PA system and says, Sandoval, number 88419, you're wanted in reception. Oh, my gosh. What? what? Probably a long-lost family member of mine, if you know my family at all. Being in prison <laughs> wouldn't be that uh, shocking. Um, so I took, I took that, took it, and I wrote a song called 88419. Oh my gosh. It's absolutely awesome. Even one of our one of our uh, listeners said LOL lost awesome. <laughs> and Rosie, of course, said, you know Rosie, so she's well, saying you two are awesome. So she's enjoying this. Um, where are you where are you seeing these comments? Am I, am I able to well, see? You, I don't know, but oh, the system looks system looks like if it looks like mine, but way up in the upper right hand corner, there's a little thing that says comments. Does you see anything that says comments anywhere on your screen? Oh, oh, oh. 
There it is. Yes. Got it. All right. Cool. Okay. So that brings me to my next question. Um, sounds to me you're a very hardworking man. I'm very business oriented. I that I got that right away. And yes. and you enjoy people and you enjoy sharing music with them. Uh, have you during this time that from the beginning when you were in high school when you said you started until now has there been any any particular aha moment or something that just stands out other than this johnny cash thing you were just talking about um in the extended version of his of his record or anything that just said my gosh my gosh i mean that was enough to answer that question is there anything else out there um not specifically um uh, you know, the funny thing is when I, like when I was in high school, like I told you, like didn't know anything about music. And then all I wanted to do, like sitting there just thumping on, on one string, like, man, I just, I just want to learn how to play a riff. Then I'll be happy. That's all I want. <laughs> I to learn to play a riff. It's like, whoa, that's really cool. Then you think, well, now I just want to, you know, now I just want to learn to play a song. Then you learn how to play a song. Yes. And then, oh, I just want to learn how to play a song with a band. Then you learn how to, <laughs> and it just keeps going and going. There's always yeah. more, right? Yeah. Now, the other, now the, the, the flip side of that is I have a good friend who was, who played drums for a long time in original bands and like, you know, gigging every weekend and all that kind of stuff. Now that we're a little older, he has two kids and he put up on Facebook a while back. He says, like, I'm having a really hard time. Like, he, he finally quit whatever band he was in to be home with his kids and spend weekends with his kids. And he says, you know, I ha I'm having a really hard time not being in a band, quitting music. I'm, I'm just having a really hard time with it. I, I get on there and I tell him, you know, if you have music, you have music. It's if you're, yeah, you're not going to your friend's house and jamming with your original band twice a week and then gigging all the time, but you still have music, You're a musician, you play music. So when your kids are old enough and they want to play music, you can show them what you know and you, you can then spread that music to them. So it's not like you're quitting music, you still have it. He thought that was a good idea. This, this was a couple of years ago. And now every, every once in a while, he'll post pictures of his little kid behind his drum kit or his other kid banging on a guitar it's like this is what music's about yeah i have i have, I have a site called musicians that we're on right now of course and um a lot of people get confused and think that it's just for people who are, are more mature than the younger crowd but it's not it's about the maturity of the music and i i i've hopefully encouraged people that come to this site and listen to these interviews to continue. I mean, there's really no age when you have to stop music. And in that process, it always seems that as you go with your music, you include others and begin to mentor and, and tutor. And I think um, it's just amazing how the generation continue with that. My family was very musical, so. I, I think I have some of it. I don't know how much, but anyway. And I'm country. I, I thought you, you rocker guys were a, a bunch of lunatics, but I changed my mind after listening. And I have to credit that to Lynn Sorensen and Manuel Marais. They they were um they the first time I walked into a concert at Dave's in Milton, they were playing there and I heard them up close and personal and I I said, Hey. I got to find out more about this. Pretty cool. <laughs> so that's how that got started. Anyway, um, with the time remaining, uh, I would like to I would like to look at <clears> or <throat> like to have you tell us if you have uh, goals. Like for instance, um, one of the things I noticed that you don't have, although <laughs> your idea of sharing the places around you where people can bring in food is very unique. Do you have you any plans? I mean, what are your future and your music? What are the goals of the future for your company? And what is, what are you thinking about uh, food? Is there any plans for that in the future? Do you get a bigger 
place or whatever? There, there's not a plan for food because we're so small here at Snowtown Brewery. There's, I mean, we're, we're packed in pretty tight as it is. Yeah. And being located right next to a Mexican restaurant across the street yeah. from a cheeseburger place, uh, we just you know encourage people to either bring their own food in or have something delivered. You know, we're right here in town. If we were you know, in the middle of the country or something, it'd be pretty different. But right now, just the two of us, it's easy enough to just have two and no real no no employees. And if you add a kitchen, then you always need the both you know two people here, one person to be in the kitchen, one person to be serving. That's just not really what we're looking at. You know what I mean? So then when it comes to the brew side, that's what that's what I like to focus on. Um, we just got some new equipment that you see right there. Um, that stuff, that's brand new. That just came in earlier this year, and that's up and running and going well. We might get another couple of, you know, another couple of fermenters that are, that are bigger so we can expand out a little bit and sell a couple more kegs. But other than that, we're just kind of toeing the line. You know, we don't, we don't have too many big changes planned out because things are going well as it is. How many, how many different, I don't know. I don't know the first thing about beer except on a hot day, I like to drink it. <laughs> but how many different kinds of flavors do you have? What, what is your, what is your um, menu looking like? Right now, I think we have 13. Wow. Yeah, it's quite, it's quite a few, but. Then, uh, you can you can these as well as half of them. Half of them. So, how in the world do you? I mean, I have no clue. I've never brewed anything in my life like that. I wouldn't even know how. But how did you come across these formulas? I mean, what do you do to get something new, something that uh, becomes a good seller? How do you how do you do something like that? So we started out with, uh, you know, the five gallon homebrew recipes way back in the day. And those were usually a clone recipe, as they say. So someone will figure out Sierra Nevada pale ale and write down the recipe on how to brew it at home, brew it small, you know. Mm -hmm. So from there, because we brewed so much at home that when we come, came here back in the day, we just scaled that up. And from there, you would make minor adjustments until it's finally, finally what you're looking for. That's like I, what I said earlier with the whole, you know, we're small, so I'm brewing all the time. So I'm able to make micro adjustments, you know, multiple times th throughout a, a beer's life cycle, if you will, until it's dialed in. Yeah. So who is, how do you taste this? I mean, how do you, how do you taste all the beer without becoming a raging alcoholic? <laughs> well, you got to take it slow and you got to drink a lot of uh, vitamin water. <laughs> oh, that's a key. <laughs> so I, I tasted, I, I couldn't stand the thought of not tasting one of your beers. So I said to Kurt, go up and get about two ounces of anything. I don't care. Pay full price, but I don't want any more than two ounces. So I ended up with four ounces, which I couldn't drink two of them. And it was, it, it was, uh, no, I like dark beers and I'm kind of partial to Canadian dark beers. Oh. So I had a dark beer. I don't know what it's called, um, but it had um, a very different taste. Uh, um, I don't know what you put in it. Uh, can you explain a little bit about your dark beers and, and what goes into that? Uh, I believe you had our porter okay. and it was, it's black as night. <laughs> it's almost a stout, okay? Uh -huh. uh, so it's just extra roasted malts. Um, mm. I, I dialed that one in quite a while ago. That one's a, a really good, solid beer. Um, what I do is I, I mash in all the grains, and then I take the, the really, really dark roasted malt, and I float that on top so it doesn't pull out all of that astringency, it's, but it's still a full roasted, you know, mm -hmm. Yes. Well, I have to admit it was stellar. <laughs> so, I, and I, I, I apologize that I couldn't drink it all, but um, my body can't take that stuff anymore. So, uh, yeah, I, 
I have to admit, I, I there's a wonderful plan that uh, I was trying to think of. I think it was HR was drinking it there that um, was lighter. And I asked him what it was, and now I don't know. But it seemed like it was fairly light beer. Uh, do, what do you have some of those? And what are they called? And how are they different than your dark beer? Oh, so, so I think HR the other day was drinking our Pilsner. Yeah, now, that's it. That's Pilsner is, couldn't be more different than a than a, a, a porter. Pilsner is made with uh, much lighter malts. Almost none of it roasted like that. Um, so a, a, a lighter malts, and we use a lager yeast. A lager yeast is is way different in the sense that it takes. We lager that one for about six weeks where the porter and other beers are ready to be drank in two weeks or so. So it, it's just a longer, slower process. Mm -hmm. But it, if, if you do it right, it comes out great. Oh. Yeah. Well, I learned a lot about beer from you. <laughs> so oh, with those things behind you that you say are new, uh, I don't want to concentrate too much on your, on your brewery, but um, those shiny metal whatever's what is that exactly what is that what is that, what is that all about? And, and why did you get new ones mm -hmm. well what you see over on this side yeah here that's the brew side hot side if you will that's okay. where I, I mix up the mash mix it with hot water transfer it over to the other pot boil it add hops cool it down and then it's brought over to the cylinders over there I see it. <laughs> to the fermenters ah okay. and after I pitch the yeast the yeast then eats the alcohol and the fermentation the yeast eats the sugars converts it to alcohol it mm -hmm. spends about two weeks in those fermenters I got more I actually what I did is I got rid of the two smaller ones that I had and I got two bigger ones yeah. so this way I could brew full batches of everything and try to keep up and I'm still it, it's okay it's better than it was but I'm still running out of beer once in a while. Oh, no. Specific types. Well, that's a good problem to have. Or, or that yeah, it is. Absolutely. Uh, in the, we got 15, about 15 minutes left. So I would like to concentrate a little bit on uh, where you're going from here. Do you have any music coming out? Do you have any gig dates set up? Um, what are your goals for your band, uh, Johnny Loves June? And are you in any other band at this time? Right now, it's just the band Johnny Loves June. Um, unfortunately, our drummer is having carpal tunnel surgery, ah. which which yeah. is terrible. But um, but he, strong guy, he'll probably be back in a month. So we look forward to coming back. We'll be playing Snowtown Brewery um, this summer for sure. We just got to find out, you know, see how his how his surgery goes, and hopefully we can get back sooner than later. Uh, the sad part is. Um, right before COVID, we had the best lineup of dates we had ever had. We are all, you know, like I said, those guys are in their own band called the Rain Heroes. Yeah. Everyone has kids and jobs and wives and such. We had just a stellar calendar, including we were going to play at Marymore for the uh, Father's Day Brewfest. And COVID happened, and everything got deleted. So here we are, starting to build back from nothing again. So oh boy. Uh, our only goal is just to you know keep playing good music and having a great time. And if if new original songs come out, like I'm Not a Dog, uh, <laughs> we'll hopefully hopefully record that. I just love that. I don't know. I, I was listening to it and I gave it to my husband to listen to it and then I started passing it around. It was so cute. Uh, I mean, what, what looking at, at obviously everybody's trying to build back and, and my husband works for healthcare and so they get brief and, the, and so do teachers. Uh, they get brief on the latest um, kinds of virus mutations that COVID and right now uh they're warning us about fall september and there's been they don't know quite yet um just what this stuff does so it's all new 
it's mutated again, and they don't know how effective it's going to be or what it's going to do to the economy. What do you have in mind if if you get shut down again? What will you do? You would just continue with your rollers and your cans, or do you have a specific idea how you handle it? Uh, I don't have a specific idea because I, I feel like we're not going to get shut down again. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Uh, if God forbid it happens, you know, we have, like I said, we have a pretty loyal following. Luckily, we were, we had opened up years before and we've had time to grow this following that we have. And I think that if anything bad like that happened again, we'd make it just with our to go sales. Yeah, you could, you also could go outside too because you got that great patio out there. Or beer garden, yeah. Uh, it's also uh, when the rain pours down and gets kind of hairy out there. But <laughs> so I, I was also um, sitting there when a band came in, and, and one of the people that um, I knew from another brewery who was doing jams came in, and I believe you set them up so for for a show. And so, are you? Do you hire bands or or people to play, or how does that work? Yeah, yeah, we have open mic on Thursdays, and then Friday, Saturday, we have live music, 7 o'clock, Friday and Saturday. Okay, so it, since you have the band, uh, why are you, are you, well, I can, I know why you're not playing, you're always zipping around. <laughs> yeah, uh, my band, you, last year, I think it was last year, my band played here like every month. And it was uh, it was a good way to really even though like things were a little bit slower because of COVID, right. it was a good way to try out new songs and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, I've enjoyed my time there, so I'm sure most of the musicians who go in there enjoy it. Um, I did get a chance to hear you play, and I didn't know. I mean, I knew you were a brewer, but I didn't know you were a musician. And I saw the guitarist, and I thought. Well, I don't know. I mean, does he play him? So you got <laughs> you got up and played with the guys. You, I think Jeffrey was one of the people and a few others. And from time to time, you do that. Um, and it, yeah, it's good. So you're not related to Johnny? You don't have those genes? How'd you get that voice? <laughs> just, just stuck with me. I don't know. Yeah. I, I started out doing a lot of karaoke and... And I um, went to West Virginia for a couple of years and listened to all the bluegrass and all the West Virginia music out there, spoons, washboards, I mean, you name it. And uh, I eventually met my husband and he encouraged me to start a band, which we did. So uh, I'm, I'm definitely from the country tradition and I did start out karaoke and I, I got blackballed for that for a while, for a long time. So does he play? No, he's a sound man and he does, um, he did all our booking. So we were out there for about 15 years. Uh, we were called Bush Fever. He did all the bookings and he does all the sound and he, he is so good at the sound that when we're working for Rhino events, when they're sometimes their sound men would get caught and they wouldn't be able to fly in in time for that concert so he would he would run the system so anyway that that and so he does all that and he keeps quite busy and obviously i'm not since COVID, i haven't been playing i was playing with a bottle bottle uh, senior volunteer band out of um out of, out of the bottle senior center and Every Tuesday we would play all over for you know in inpatient um, facilities and housing, fifty five plus housing, etc. And I I played that until COVID shut them down and it never started in again. So I'm kind of floundering, but I got a little rusty. I mean, two years I, I didn't play. You know, I mean, I wrote I I wrote music and produced music and had a Chad Chris produced it for me. So I got an album out, but you know, I, I, you get rusty if you're not out there and, and musicians don't practice and they don't play live, you, know, you kind of wither around the line. Yeah. Yeah, there's a big difference between playing at home and playing in front of people. <laughs> yeah, well, I can do good at home. Then I get out there and it's like, why are you still getting stage fright after all this time? It's been almost 20 years. What's happening here? 
<laughs> so anyway, and I'm a perfectionist, so that doesn't help me any. My own worst critic, I guess. Unlike you, I don't have quite the, uh, what would I have to say? You're, you're not aggressive because that's not, not the word I'm looking for, but gutsy. You're a gutsy guy. You have to go after it. Not too shy. Not too shy. <laughs> too shy. Too shy. So, in closing, there are a lot of people, um, you know, I've got over about, I've got about right now about 765 listeners, and not everybody tunes in live. It's kind of a hot time of day. But this is the only time I can get musicians because they're not out playing. <laughs> so, so if you had to give um, people up and coming um, some advice about, I mean, you're kind of three things. You're an entrepreneur, you're a musician, and a songwriter. And you're also, from what you were just saying, to some extent, a booker. I mean, you do bring people into your establishment. So um, what kind of advice? <laughs> give us if um so we can draw from your experiences yeah oh, <laughs> uh, advice uh man i'd just say get out there and do it uh try try to be a you know maybe maybe don't be a perfectionist try yeah. to get try to get it you know get it good get it well yes. know what you're doing yes but if it's not you know not everything is going to be stairway to heaven if you have a song, it, <laughs> if, it, if, if it's a song, your song or somebody else's song, whatever, get out there and share it. I mean, maybe it won't change the world, but you got to get out there and do it. We had we had a young lady come in, and she was she would do open mic once in a while, but she would also play shows like her and her friend would like split a night, and she was she was she was good. She had a good voice. She played piano well, and she played here a handful of times, okay? And then one day she was on Facebook. She said how, how upset it was, how she doesn't, you know, she doesn't have it. She doesn't, you know what I mean? Like, she, I, I think she, and I, I don't want to sound cynical, but I think she thought she was going to be the next singer-songwriter on the radio. Extraordinary, <laughs> yeah. She, she she never made that, but, but she was good. I mean, people liked her. She her friends liked her. Her family liked her. She got frustrated because she wasn't getting I don't know discovered or something. Right? Mm -hmm. don't, don't worry about don't worry about packing a house. Don't worry about people falling over themselves over your song. <laughs> yeah, and, and play your songs and enjoy it, and people will enjoy it with you. That's my. All right. Good advice. Good advice. I still struggle all the time with that. And it's hard for me. And it's hard for women to enter into the world of music and bands and playing in public, et cetera. Not as much as it used to be, but, but and especially uh, in country as well. And uh, it's a hard struggle to grow up with a band full of rockers and do country. <laughs> So, yeah, I'm learning all the time, and I'm sure there's other people out there still struggle with stage fright, still struggle thinking that you're not good enough. But, yeah. you know, it, it's I'm not out there to get famous. So I'm not out there to, I'm, I wouldn't mind a gig for time, to time, but I'm still working on my EPK. But, um, you know, it, 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 being a star isn't important, but relating to the people and pleasing the people that you're playing for that's everything your fans are people who listen to you that's the whole ball game yeah i i fully agree you don't have to you're not gonna you're not gonna sell out sell out <laughs> of the room you're not gonna make a million dollars with your new song but if you're out there playing it if you enjoy it they'll enjoy it yes i believe that Absolutely. So I guess it's time to wrap up. We only have two minutes um, left. Frank, I've enjoyed the interview. I encourage everybody out there who's listening who have not been in Snowtown to get go to Snohomish and find it. And I, I don't think you'll regret it. And I, one thing, the only time I've ever played alone uh, without people backing me up because I'm, I'm used to a band, full band, um, with that Frank's establishment, that's how comfortable I felt to do that. So come on out, I'm sure you'll enjoy it. 
<laughs> All right, Frank. Thank you so much for joining us today. And I hope um, at some time in the future um, that we can do it again. All right. Let's do it. All right. Ha have a good rest of your weekend. You Take too. care. Bye, guys. Thanks for listening today. I do have a few things coming up. Um, I have uh, uh, um, Doug Russ uh, from, he, he does a lot of uh, gigs out at um, the Oxford Saloon in Snohomish. So do catch him next week. And coming up, um, I have a couple of people that haven't fully committed, but on the 27th, uh, of June, I have Chris Egger. Uh, he is a award-winning Washington blues um, musician. He writes his own music, and he is he has a new uh, jam on Wednesday nights out at in uh, in Marysville at the Merkwoods um, Public House, I believe it's called. So do catch that. See you all. Thanks for listening. It's joy. Bye bye. Now let's see if I can end this this time. <laughs>